and peace are yours. Through God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The word of God that we will consider this morning is the first section of our gospel reading found in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. Now I'll just quickly read it again. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bow our heads. Lord Jesus, whenever our spiritual sight grows dim, cause the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and souls to see you, to know that you are our certain hope, and to love you all the more. In your name we pray this morning. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, the one who has come and the one who is yet promised to come. There's an old Scottish Presbyterian tradition that I used to encounter in some very old churches in the Deep South. In the pulpit, there was a plaque that was placed facing the preacher. Nobody else could see it. And all it said were these words. Sir, we would see Jesus. That's what preaching is all about. That's hopefully what worship's all about, for us to see Jesus. And those words were stolen or taken from John chapter 12, when right before, right during the Passover festival, there were some Greeks who were in the city of Jerusalem, and they approached Christ's disciples with those words, Sir, we would see Jesus. And that plaque is meant as a reminder to the pastor, to the preacher, that it's not his job to puff himself up with wonderful rhetoric or to spin entertaining yards that entertain people for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, God forbid, or something like that. Rather, the purpose is simply so that we can see Jesus in his word because that's precisely what we need in good times and in bad. Sir, we would see Jesus was the prayer of those Greeks at the Passover festival right before Christ's passion, but they also could have been John the Baptist's words as he was languishing in a prison cell, wondering what was going to be happening next, whether or not he would be free, whether or not ultimately the chopping block would be his fate. He was trapped in a moment of darkness. And so he sent his disciples, his followers to Jesus with a question, are you the one? Are you the one who was promised to come? Are you the one whom we should expect, or should we be looking for someone else? Basically what he was saying, sir, we would see Jesus. Sir, we would see Christ. That was John's prayer. And that's our prayer, too, as Christians, as we wait. Advent is a season of anticipation of waiting for Christ to come in the first time in the manger, but also focusing our attention on the fact that we are waiting for Christ to come a second time as well. John was seeking a word of hope. We as Christians seek that word as well. So let's hear about John, his request, and what Christ did in response. So as we take a look at Matthew chapter 11, we see that John the Baptist was in a very dark spot, literally and metaphorically. If you want the entire story after church, go open up your Bibles and take a look at Matthew chapter 14. It's actually quite a very interesting story. The king at that time was a gentleman loosely defined as King Herod Antipas. And he was the son of King Herod the Great, King Herod of Christmas infant. And he was just as good of a person, or not so much, as his father was. And so he had this wonderful idea that he was going to have a relationship with his sister-in-law. And John the Baptist was a choice prophet of God who was called by God to proclaim his word both in comfort and in conviction. And so he went to King Herod, he exposed that relationship to the singeing light of God's law, and it went just as well as you might have expected. The king did not take it so well, and so he had John the Baptist arrested and thrown into prison. 
And we know that John would never leave that dungeon alive. And so there's very little wonder why John was despondent. The prison was dark. It was unsanitary. The meals were something less than scrumptious. And so that's the physical element. Physical element, it was not a pleasant experience. And then on top of that, there was also psychological torture that was going on because he knew the Herods. The Herods were notorious for their cruelty, for their brutality. And so he knew that as he's languishing in that prison cell, he likely would be Herod's next victim. So you have the physical element. There's the psychological element. Then there's also that spiritual element because why is John there in the first place? Because he fulfilled God's calling. Because he spoke God's word of warning, God's word of law to the king, exposing his sin, calling him to repentance. And so all John did was follow what God had commanded him to do. And now he's in that dark, dank prison cell awaiting his ultimate fate. And so prison grated on John the Baptist in body and mind and soul. And it grated on him more and more and more. And so John had a question for his cousin Jesus. And we find in verse 3 of our text, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? John's despair led to death, which is incredible when you think about everything that John had experienced and what he knew for a fact. The evangelist Luke tells us that when the Virgin Mary came to Elizabeth's door, Elizabeth being John the Baptist's mother, and said what the archangel Gabriel had told her, that the Savior of the world was going to be born, that was going to be her child. Preborn John the Baptist leapt in his womb for joy, knowing that that was his Savior too. As John grew older and he entered into his prophetic career, his prophetic calling, John confessed by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that this is the Lamb of God, Jesus is, who takes away the sin of the world. John knew that. John also knew that he was not worthy to carry that man, to carry Jesus' sandals, which was the work of a slave. So John knew that he was not even worthy to be Jesus Christ, his cousin's slave. And then when against his will, against his, you know, what he wanted to do, John baptized his cousin Jesus. He witnessed an unparalleled manifestation of the Holy Trinity as God the Father in heaven pointed down to the beloved Son, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended as a dove. As a dove. John saw all this, he experienced all this, and he knew all of it for a fact, and yet now he sends his disciples to Jesus Christ with a question. Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? In other words, again, knowing everything that he knows, experiencing after everything he's experienced, are you the one who is to come? Are you the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Are you the beloved Son with whom the Father is well pleased? Are you the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and my Savior? Or should we look for somebody else? Deep in Herod's dungeon, even for this choice prophet of God, the answer to those questions was very hard to tell. Just as sometimes can be very difficult for us. Now, it shouldn't be too tough for us to be able to relate with John the Baptist. Now, we haven't had the exact same experiences as John the Baptist had, but the Holy Spirit has caused us to have that exact same faith. We show that to be the case every Sunday. We show it right now when we join together and by the Holy Spirit's creative faith within us. We confess our belief. That I believe that we believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, the only begotten Son of the Father. We show that every time we echo Christ's explanation right before we receive Lord's Supper, O oh Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Now those little things can seem mundane, they can seem a little bit on the rote side, but nevertheless, that is genuine Holy Spirit created faith on display right there. We believe as John believed, and our faith fills us with the same joy that John felt as he left within his mother's womb on hearing that his Savior was coming. Consider all the different ways that you, like John, have witnessed God at work, not only in your own life, but in the lives of those around you. Think of all the moments that God has encountered you with his grace. 
very quickly we'll come to understand that John's faith and knowledge are not all that much different from our faith and knowledge of who God is and who is our Savior. We know who Jesus is, and we believe and truly genuinely. But then life walls us. For John, it was indefinite imprisonment that ultimately led to his execution. And have you ever been knocked around by life to the point that it disorients you? And then your faith gets knocked around in the process. Has something ever caused your faith in Jesus as your Savior, as the Son of God, as the promised Messiah, as the center of your faith, and the lens to which you understand the entire world and your entire life, to waver? Now, a lot of times those sorts of experiences, those earth-shattering, faith-rocking experiences can be very, very private. So we don't necessarily tell the whole world about them, but especially here in Utah in the last few years, it's become more and more common and trendy to talk about those things, to record podcasts about those things, to write books about these things. And a lot of times we call them a faith crisis. A tragedy occurs, we witness injustice and evil, we wonder why that's the case, or we experience something that radically overturns our sense of reality. And then it all snowballs. We have question after question, we have experience after experience, and that snowball rolls down that hill and then also then rolls our faith along with it. Our faith is heard in the process. This story of John's imprisonment and questioning speaks to those sorts of situations. And there's two things I think that need to be said about this. First of all, for those of us who have had those experiences, or may yet have those experiences at some point later on in the future, this is a story that gives you and me hope. It reminds us that we are not the few, we are neither the first nor the last person whose faith rocks and rolls with the waves when storms hit. If it could happen to a prophet of God, then perhaps it's not so strange that every now and then our faith wavers as well. That's just simply a fact of the Christian life here in this fallen world. Whenever that happens to us, if that ever happens to us, we can find a fellow journeyman in John the Baptist. But secondly and most importantly, John provides us with an example of how to react when the waves crash around our faith. A prophet shows God's path, and that's what John is doing here even in the midst of his own deep despair and darkness. <coughs> John's faith was fragile. It was almost at the breaking point. And so what does John do? He seeks Christ. He seeks a word of hope from his Savior. Now, he himself cannot do it. He's locked up in that dungeon cell, so therefore he sends his followers <coughs> with that question, with that message to Jesus. Are you the one whom we, who is promised to come? Are you the one whom we should expect? Or should we be looking for somebody else? Now, importantly, he didn't deny his faith. He didn't retreat into the dark recesses of his mind. Rather, even in that moment of darkness, he still, at least in a glimmer, knew who Jesus was. He sent those messengers to Jesus with that question, seeking that word of hope. He sought a word of hope from the word of God, and as always, the word of God did not disappoint. Here's what the word of God incarnate, Jesus Christ, told John. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now those words can seem very, very cryptic to our ears. This might be another occasion when we just wish Jesus would just say yes or no. Yes or no. Make it really simple. But what Jesus here is doing is something he does again and again and again. It was very common for Jewish rabbis, and Jesus does this as well, to combine different passages of Scripture to point you to the, to, to the central message of God's Word. And that's what Jesus does here right now. He combines two second sections from the prophet Isaiah. The first one is from Isaiah 35, verse 2 to 5. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. And here's the second. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. 
Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. That's the first passage. The second passage then is Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. John seeks a word of hope, and Christ gives him that word of hope. John asks whether or not Jesus is the promised Christ, and then Jesus replies with God's word, and to signs which confirm and strengthen John's faith that his cousin is indeed the promised Messiah. And brothers and sisters, Jesus does not do anything different with us. Whenever our faith is shaken, Whenever we wonder, is this Christianity thing, is it real, is it really worth it? Christ invites us to approach him and to seek a word of hope. He invites us to tread the path that was taken by his cousin John. John sought a word of hope from the word of God, and that's what we do too. And Jesus always responds. Now just like with John, Jesus doesn't get up right in our face, jump up and down saying, yes, I'm the Christ, yes, I'm the Messiah, yes, I'm the troubleshooter to all of your problems. But rather what Jesus does is what exactly he did with John. He pointed to all the miracles that he performed during his public ministry, which were prophesied in the Old Testament to be Messiah and Messiah's appearance. And then Jesus takes God's word for us and he points us to his life, his death, and his resurrection. And then he applies them to our own situation and our lives. A couple of examples. We feel desperately alone. And we approach him seeking a word of hope. Lord, are you the one who promised me that I would never be left abandoned or forsaken? Or should I look for somebody else? And then Jesus gives us that word of hope. He points us to the sign of the manger and he says, I am Emmanuel. God with us, God with you, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. I became a man so that you would never ever be alone, so that I would be one with you in the hardships of life. We grieve a death when we approach him seeking a word of hope. Lord, are you the one who defeated death, or should we look for another? And then Jesus points us to the empty tomb, and then he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall not perish and have everlasting life. I died on Good Friday so that death would lose its sting for all those who believe in me. And I was raised on Easter Sunday to reveal that death is not the end. We feel weighed down by guilt and regret, and then we wonder, Jesus, are you the one who promised to bring me forgiveness? Or should I be looking for somebody else? And then Jesus replies through a pastor's lips, I forgive you all of your sins now and always. We look around at all the injustice and evil out there and within us, and then we wonder, God, where are you in this all of this? And then Jesus comes to us, he points us to his altar, and he says, here I am. Come and eat and drink. Feast on me and receive a foretaste of the new age to come, when all the former things have passed away. Whenever we are in the midst of darkness, Christ invites you and me to come to him and beg for a word of hope. And Jesus is never silent. Through his word, he points us to all the signs of his coming. He points us to his life, and his death, and his resurrection, and all the signs that are yet to come. One of the wonderful things about the Christian faith is that it is so honest and so realistic. Nowhere does it say that your faith will never be tested. Nowhere does it say that our faith sometimes will not be stretched to the very breaking point. But Christ promised you today and always is that if you come to him with your burdens, seeking a word of hope, he will give it to you. And through his word, he will give you comfort. He'll give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. And there you will find rest for your soul. As Christ gave to us now and always in his most holy name. Amen. And please receive your word of blessing. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keeping guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.
We continue by seeing our offertory increase.